So Patrick Lencioni, anyway, started with that book. There's the advantage, and then there's the ideal team player. And that's his most recent book. <clears throat> All of our employees, including our new hires, are asked to read that book. And here's what I think is an awesome conduit to take those ideas and make your career better. At the same time, you're bringing your faith into the workplace. You know, St. Francis talks about you should always be evangelizing and only use words when necessary. We really can't use words in the workplace. We can only do it by our actions. On a personal level, you can look, use words, which I'll get to in a moment. So Lencioni says in the business world, leaving faith completely aside, who and what would be you would want to aspire to to make your career the best you could be? And his opinion would be the ideal team player. And what is that? So he says the first thing you should be is humble. This lines up exactly with what Harry left off with last night. It was actually mentioned in the homily this morning at Mass. Humility. Not thinking about yourself first, thinking about the team. If there's something good that's been done, give credit quickly. If something's done by the team, have the team get the credit, not you. Now, C.S. Lewis puts it this way. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, right? You still want to have confidence. You guys have great educations. You've worked hard for what you have. You should be confident. But in that confidence, you do it in a, in a, in a, with, a, with a, an element of humility to it. Think about it. When you work with people, do you like working on your team with people that are, are cocky? Or do you like working with the people that are, are humble about what they've done, even though they contributed a lot? It's very appealing. The second thing he talks about is hungry. So this is someone that's self-motivated, someone that wants to do an extra good job, someone that wants to, 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 to learn more. As an employee or someone on your team, as a team member, right? You're, you want to work with people that are always trying to get better at what they do. If you demonstrate that quality, again, you make yourself attractive. It's smart. This one probably takes the most explanation. This isn't smart in the way we typically think of it. This is more, and it's not even emotional intelligence, but it's directionally more that. Do you have common sense about how to deal with people? Do you ask good questions? Do you listen? That's an acquired skill that not too many people have acquired in life. Are you engaged in a conversation? That makes you attractive. That's how you become friends with people at work. That's how you advance your career. I'm going to give you another subset of this. So the Democratic debates were on uh, Thursday night. And so there's lots of, you know, uh, evaluations on Friday. One of them was a gentleman by the name of Navarro. He wrote an article for Politico. I think it was. So I saw him speak two years ago at the University of Chicago. He's the former head FBI counterinterrogation inter inter uh, expert. He's an expert on body language. 80% of what you and I are experiencing right now is visual. Only about 20% of my words hit you. 80% is, is you looking at me and me looking at you. Our brain and our eyes process information 25 times faster with the eye than they do with the ear. So if I come to you, and this is just a quick example of what Navarro would do. He says, if I come to you and I'm going to ask you to invest $10 million with me, would you all like to invest $10 million in my latest harebrained idea, right? So here's my hands. Now, same thing. What if I come to you and I go, uh, anybody here want to invest $10 million with me? Wow. Same tone, same words, but very different message. Am I right? He had a fascinating one. I'll give you another one real quick. So he said, if you're talking to a woman and she covers her neck, she's frightened subconsciously. You need to slow down your language. You need to back up your posture. You need to slow down, Tiger, because you're frightening whoever you're talking to. He talked about Joe Biden on Thursday. There was a little furrow between his two eyes when he got asked about his stuff about uh, immigration, and he went through a whole list of what that meant. The fascinating one, I'll give you real quick and I'll move on. Navarro put up the same picture uh, excuse me, uh, two pictures of the same woman. There was one on the left and a right. In the room was probably about this size. He says, how many of you like the picture on the right? We're all chuckling like it's the same woman. Well, okay, fine, but which one do you like? Most of the room, including me, including me, raised my hand. I like the one on the right. Here's what he told us. When you're an infant and you're in your mother's arms, the love is so intense that her eyes dilate. As an infant, your subconscious picks that up. 
So all of us in that room, our subconscious was telling us the woman on the right, her eyes are dilated. I was like, wow, okay. Um, and, and I've found, come to find out that most magazine covers, they Photoshop the eyes to dilate them because it makes us more engaging. My point to all this is when you're trying to become the ideal team player, your skills around dealing with people and understanding people is going to advance your career and make you more of an ideal team player. So how many of you in here know Father Rocky from Relevant Radio? Just a couple. So let me tell you about Father Rocky real briefly because I think his background is relevant. Father Rocky went to Northwestern where Harry Kramer, uh, Kramer uh, 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 teaches, got his MBA, became a CPA, worked at Crow Chiswick for eight years. Then he decided to become a Catholic priest. He's now the head of Relevant Radio, which is the largest Catholic radio station network in the country. So he's a CEO. He's in the business world as a priest, though. I was playing golf with him two weeks ago, and I said, hey, I'm going to YCP. I'm going to talk about work in, 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 uh, in the work, excuse me, faith in the workplace. What advice would you give? So he sends me an email th that night, and here's what he tells me. He says, number one, they should have humility. Number two, they should give others credit. Number three, they should tell the truth. He spent like five minutes on this. Don't fudge your expense reports. Don't pad your sales numbers, etc. Just last week, another big corporate auto executive got canned because he's padding his sales numbers to get a bigger compensation package. You all know that, right? It's so basic, but it's so important. Under promise, over deliver, try your best. Finally, do the right thing. As I looked at his list, here's what I see. Humble, hungry, and smart. There's the connection. Lencioni is telling you that to be an ideal team player should be humble, hungry, and smart. Father Rocky's telling us if you practice the Christian virtues, you're humble, hungry, and smart. It ties in beautifully. All right. So let me spend just a minute on humble, hungry, and smart. Because you might look at that and say to yourself, yeah, okay, fine. But break those down a little bit and see how quickly this falls apart. If you're just humble... Lencioni calls you a pawn. You're going to get manipulated all day long because you're just a nice guy or a nice girl. What if you're just hungry? Who wants to work with that person? He's a bulldozer. He doesn't care about anything. He only cares about his career. You can smell that a mile away, can't you? What if you're just smart? Lencioni calls that person the charmer. Good for him. Maybe not for everybody else. What if you mix two of them together? What if you're humble and smart? Lindsay only calls you the lovable slacker. You get no motivation. You're a nice guy to be around, but you're not going anywhere. What if you're humble and hungry? You're the accidental mess maker. You're humble. You want to go places, but you don't realize that you shouldn't ask a woman this or you shouldn't say that to a guy. He just has no emotional intelligence. Just dead, Right? My first job, I was in tax, and we had a guy who was brilliant at the code. And I was there not too long, and they were telling me, well, yeah, you know, Bob works in an office with no doors. I said, what do you mean? You don't really don't spend any time with them unless you got a question. Just trust me. I said, okay, fine. So anyways, so, and what about if you're uh, hungry and smart, but not humble? He calls that the skillful politician. Here again... Is that someone you want to work with? Not necessarily, right? So here we are started at the beginning with humble, hungry, and smart in the culture and what we have to fight against. If I spend a minute on evangelization, so uh, St. Jose Maria of Opus Dei talks a lot about right work and faith and how they come together. And one of his messages is you can't evangelize someone if you're not a friend. Friendship has to come first. So if you're at work and you're humble, hungry, and smart, and you do some unsolicited favor for somebody, will they remember that? I do. If you're attracted to work with because you're really driven and you're humble and you're trying to do the right thing, and you want to go out for a beer, shoot some baskets, or go to a tennis match or whatever, do people want to do that with you? Sure. Hey, Bob, you want to go golf on Sunday? Ah, you know what? I can't. I have to go to Mass first. How about after that? Oh, you're Catholic. Sure. Now there's an opening. Now you're not preaching. They invited you in. 
Now you can evangelize with words. Before you can only do it with actions. But that doesn't seem as frightening, at least not to me. I think all of you probably have examples of that in your life where you reach people because of your friendship. That's an easy way, quote unquote, to evangelize. So this is a battle to me. Our culture is telling us all the things we talked about earlier. Every day, we're in the workplace trying to do what we think is the right thing. And not everybody wants to hear it. Uh, some are actively against it. Many are just passively disinterested. So how do you keep up your energy? How do you keep up your motivation and your drive and your hope? Because some of that stuff is pretty sobering. For me, it's these handful of things. The first is the sacraments. If you practice the sacraments or engage in the sacraments, I should say, as often as you can, that's step number one. That's the hugest foundation for everything. The summit of our faith is the Eucharist, right? And here's Pope Francis going to confession. I remember reading John Paul II went to confession every week. I'm like, oh, dear God. <laughs> wow, okay, what am I doing? But practicing the sacraments. The second is prayer. So here's Eucharistic adoration and the rosary. How many of you have heard or uh, are familiar with Father Don Calloway? A few of you. You've heard his life story, right? Incredible. For those of you that haven't, here's the teaser. He grew up disinterested, if anything, anti-religious, used drugs, followed the Grateful Dead for several years, and now he's a Catholic priest. The connection's fascinating. I encourage you to go look his YouTube stuff up. So we saw him uh, speak two years ago at the Legatus Conference. And he referenced a father, excuse me, a bishop, Oliver Domi, D-O-E-M-E, if you want to look him up. So this just happened a few years ago. He's a bishop in Africa. He's in his private chapel in front of the Eucharist saying the rosary. How many of you remember Boko Haram, who kidnapped uh, all those young girls? Remember that? A handful of years ago? Yep. So he's there saying the rosary in front of the Eucharist, and our Lord appears to him. You can literally YouTube him, and you can see him tell the story. Our Lord is standing in front of him with a sword. Doesn't say a word. Our Lord extends his hands to give the bishop the sword. And as the bishop reaches for it, it turns into a rosary. And our Lord says to the bishop, Boko Haram, gone. Boko Haram, gone. Boko Haram, gone. And our Lord disappeared. Wow. Right? So you think about Eucharistic adoration. Some priests call that the nuclear generator of prayer in a parish. And for me, the rosary is the most simple and profound prayer that we can use. If you can say part of the rosary every day, if you can say the whole rosary every day, look up and Google the 15 promises of the rosary. If you can read that list of 15 things and not be moved to say the rosary, you're better than I am. Finally, reading. There's so many facets of the Catholic faith that we can make ourselves more formed in and motivational. For me, it's the lives of the saints. I find that stuff so motivational, so inspiring. Others have an appetite for papal uh, encyclicals. God help them, or God love them, I should say, right? Everyone's got a different angle on this. Whatever it is, you, in my opinion, you have to do this every day, even if it's five minutes. If you're not putting that in the front, at least for me, it's coming out the back because I got hours and hours every day coming in, flushing it right back out the back. So if I don't go to Mass, I don't um, pray, and I don't read, then I run out of my energy, runs low, and I, and I slide back. Whatever that combination is for you, I really encourage you to do it because that's essentially what allows you to stay in the battle. You know, uh, uh, Bishop Barron talks about how in today's world, to become a Catholic priest, a young seminarian, they know they're going to be a martyr for the faith. You know, he talks about how you go through a, uh, a, an airport with a collar on. If you're a Catholic priest, people will say tough things to you. People will give you the finger or worse because you're a Catholic priest. If you're signing up to be a seminary right now, that's what you're signing up for. You know it. 
You guys are not normal people in a good way. By virtue of the fact that you're here, God's given you a lot of faith. You have to be that mustard seed that goes out and, and gives us that hundredfold harvest. You have a gift. You're in the world. You're young. You're going to reach those people that need to hear it where the priests and the, and the bishops can't go. So Bishop Barron's point, Bishop Barron's point is, it's a hard time to be Catholic, 